This conference will now be recorded. Okay, go, Meg. Okay. Um, good morning. Today we'll be talking about uh, cystic neoplasms of the pancreas. Um, we will start start with a patient. Um, this patient is JC. He is a 63-year-old male with a history of diabetes, hypertension, um, coronary artery disease, and possibly a remote history of alcohol abuse, who was originally referred to BAMC by the VA in 2013. Um, because he had a pancreatic cystic lesion. Um, the patient states that the lesion was found incidentally on a right upper quadrant ultrasound that he was getting for evaluation of his liver. Um, there was some concern that he maybe had some um, fatty liver disease or some cirrhosis. Um, the patient underwent a CT scan at that time, which showed a circumscribed hypodense mass involving the unfinite process of the pancreas. The mass measured um, two by 1.7 by 2.3 centimeters and um, imaging findings favored branch duct type uh, IPN. Um, so for this patient, uh, the 63 year old male with this incidentally noted mass um, on, on CT imaging, um, uh, what would be our workup? Um, Kat, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, so incidental mass on CT imaging. Um, and we got imaging. Uh, we could start with just doing a history and physical on him and then doing um, other lab tests. For him. Yeah. And so we know it's a cyst too because it, the, the imaging it looks like a cyst. And so, um, what specifically for cyst do we want to, what labs stuff are we going to do for cyst? Unsure. Okay. Um, the next step for these is always to do it or usually do an endoscopic ultrasound with aspiration because you want to analyze the fluid. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we don't jump straight to EUS. Let's talk a little bit more about other imaging workup. Um, so I guess for a patient who has a who already has like cross-sectional abdominal imaging. So the first step is getting like a cross-sectional abdominal imaging, either like a three-phase pancreas CT or MRCP. Um, but for this patient, we already have that. We see this cyst, it looks like an IPMN. Um, so that's why I was saying that this is the way to, to do cytology on the foot. So what I'm getting at, there's different okay. guidelines that suggest there's thresholds for even doing endoscopic ultrasound. Yeah, yeah so I'm going to get more into the guidelines um, a little bit later in the talk. Sorry, I guess I was jumping ahead. Um, what I'm, I'm going to step how back. Big, how big was the cyst when he showed up? It was uh, 2 by 1.7 by 2.3. Okay, so what's your cutoff for doing an EUS? Um, I think that the guidelines had um, said uh, three centimeter mass. Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, there's like we talked about, there's different guidelines with different things, but generally two or three centimeters, depending on who you look at. One of the practical problems is that trying to do an EUS aspiration of a one centimeter cyst is virtually impossible. So part of the reason that two centimeters is a minimum is because it's just difficult, if not impossible, to do an EUS of a, something smaller than two centimeters. So that's kind of what the cutoff I use is two centimeters. And that's not, again, a lot of this is based on like expert level consensus type stuff. And so, you know, I would say most people would probably get an MRI as well, uh, in addition to CT, and that will help you do one specific thing. Um, evaluate the duct and look for dilation. Yeah, so you can see a dilated duct on CT, but the thing that MRI is better at is seeing connection to the duct. So that's one thing that will change your management a bit is if you if you have a side branch that's connected to the main duct or not connected to the main duct. And I know we'll get into this a little bit more, but that's, you know, I think getting an MRI is always reasonable because you get a little bit better 
um, on the T2 images, you'll get a little bit better delineation of the ductal anatomy. Okay. Reason, Thank yeah, you. There, there's different guidelines. The American Society, the American Clinical Gastroenterology, is different from the surgery one. But what Dr. Vreeland's getting at, these things are so common now that we're getting cross-sectional imaging on everybody. If we were to do an EUS on everybody, we would overwhelm our GI docs with unnecessary procedures. So there has to be a cutoff. You have to have you have to have a threshold at some point to have, to make it worth the time. And size is one of them, but there's some other imaging findings as well that warrant that as well. Are you going to get into that later? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this patient uh, underwent a, an endoscopic ultrasound with uh, FNA, mm -hmm. and um, the um, fluid was sent for cytology. And in 2013, this patient's CEA was 534. Um, and so this was consistent with an IPMN. And we can talk more about um, what CEA means and what the cutoff is for deciding if something is mucinous or not. I'm going to get into all of that. Um, so now, for now, we'll take a little bit of a step back before we get into, further into this specific patient. And we'll um, start by kind of just talking about pancreatic masses in general. Um, and and uh, Dr. Krell walked me through this last year, and I think that it was really um, very helpful to start by separating it up into cysts versus not cysts. Um, and so over here in the not cyst category, we have pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and solid pseudopapillary tumors. And I know that pseudopapillary tumors can have some cystic components sometimes, but I still put them in the, the not cyst category because I think that the way that we work them up um, is a little bit different, at least from my understanding, from ones that fall into the cyst category over here. Um, so now we'll discuss cystic lesions. Um, so the first one on the chart here is the pancreatic pseudocyst. Um, this is obviously most common in patients who have had a long-standing history of chronic pancreatitis. They can potentially happen after just you know two episodes of acute pancreatitis, but usually it's that patient who's had a, a pretty long course. Um, and then this can happen to anyone who gets pancreatitis. So any age, any sex, um, when we send these fluid for cytology, the amylase will be very high um, because the pseudocysts are made of pancreatic fluid and they're communicating with the duct. And then the CEA will be low because there is no mucin uh, in pancreatic pseudocysts. And so when we talk about management of, um, well, here, I think I this is a picture of a, a fairly large pseudocyst here. Um, and when we talk about management of these, the I think the key step is um, waiting and um, making sure that we're waiting for the wall of the pseudocyst to mature. And then options for drainage, um, we can do transpapillary endoscopic stenting, we can do other endoscop endoscopic trans, uh, techniques um, where you do endoscopic transluminal drainage, and then um, surgical techniques like laparoscopic cystgastrostomy or open cystgastrostomy or um, connections to other parts of the bowel besides the stomach as well for drainage. Uh, so you could do like reconstruction. Um, so Meg, just give the audience a quick rule for who you're going to intervene on in a pseudocyst. Absite level memorization knowledge. So are you getting into like the Atlanta classification and like waiting the four weeks for the wall to mature? Yeah, I mean, even more simple than that, Pfizer, you know, what does Pfizer say? Just so you guys have a number in your head. I think it says six and six, if I remember right. Somebody shake their head or yes or no, yeah. So six weeks and six centimeters is an easy thing to remember. It's absolutely not true, right? It's not how we actually clinically manage these things. There's so much more subtlety and kind of what it looks like, where it's at, how easy it is to drain, blah, blah, blah. But, and really how symptomatic it is, but that's an easy way to remember it. So if it's really big, it's probably gonna cause symptoms. Like this, this pseudocyst you're showing here, the patient probably has some symptoms, so it'd be reasonable to intervene once you feel like it's mature. But you want to wait, you know, at least a month. But I would probably wait two months, uh, and then see if they're truly symptomatic. Because a lot of times they'll just get better on their own. Um, but the ones that don't get better on their own and are actually causing symptoms, those are the ones you'll intervene on. I think the the rule of thumb is helpful mainly in that if you're doing something on a pseudocyst less than six centimeters, and in less than six weeks you should really 
take a hard look in the mirror and maybe call someone else and just talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and so our um, next statistic lesion here uh, are um, SCAs, uh, so serious cystadenomas. Um, these are the most common pancreatic lesions. And then I wrote in this column over here just some of the buzzwords to remember. Um, so for SCAs, uh, they'll be microcystic. They'll be this honeycombing appearance with the central core. Um, these are most common in um, women in their fifth and sixth decades of life. And when we send these for cytology, amylase levels will be low um, because they're not communicating with the duct. And um, CEA, CEA levels will be low as they are not mucinous. Um, SCAs are not malignant, but they can be locally aggressive. Yeah, so I don't. I, that was one thing, Meg. You wrote locally invasive there. I'd be a, li a little careful there. It doesn't really invade things, right? It just pushes things. And okay. So they sorry. can cause symptoms, like they can compress the portal vein entirely and cause a bunch of collaterals to form, and uh, they can cause gastric alloy obstruction, things like that. So that's why you would operate on them as if they're causing symptoms. Thank you. But so it's not, it's not like a cancer that invades. Right. Um, the next lesion here are mucinous cystic neoplasms. Um, these are more common. They're they're present more commonly in younger females. Um, these lesions are typically in the tail of the pancreas. So Dr. Carl describes this golf tee sign where the like um, parenchyma of the pancreas kind of wraps around the neoplasm and makes it, makes it look like a, a ball on a tee. I couldn't find any pictures of that, so I'm starting to think maybe he was messing with me, but um, I'm sure that it's a real thing. Uh, other buzz, buzzwords, F MCNs are generally macrocystic, so there's just one um, larger cyst, though they, they um, often will have substitutions, um, and then they have peripheral calcifications. These will have uh, low amylase levels because they don't communicate with the duct, um, but CEA will be very high because these are mucinous. Um, these do have malign malignant potential. And then over there, I wrote down some of the characteristics that are more concerning for malignancy. Um, and then big time buzzword, if you um, get pathology on these, they will have ovarian type stroke. So I have some pictures here. This is a picture that um, in the presentation I watched, they compared to um, a photo of a pseudocyst um, because it kind of has that um, homogenous appearance, but this is a much thicker wall than we saw with the pseudocyst. Um, and then this picture is nice because it has that peripheral calcification on the outside. Um, and then this one was just showing the septation and the calcifications of the one weren't peripheral, um, but this is still a um, who, when are you going to operate on an MCN? Um, so you're pretty much always going to take them out because they're young women and they have malignant potential. Yeah, so some people will not operate under three centimeters, but that's sort of a made up threshold. In general, I agree with you. I think most of them should come out. The, you know, you could, if you had somebody with a two centimeter MCN, you could probably watch it but it's probably gonna grow. And like you said, if the patient's 30, they're not gonna make it to 70 without that thing growing. So in general, I think you're right. And the other key aspect of taking these out is where are they? Almost always. In the tail, so you're doing yeah. a distance. So it's not a, it's not a Whipple, right? So that changes the, the, the math for you as well, so. Thank you. Um, so now moving on to IPMN. Um, these occur in older people um, and equally in men and women. Uh, there are three variants. There's the main duct IPMNs, branch duct, and mixed. Um, and main duct IPMNs obviously are associated with um, dilated pancreatic ducts usually, um, and then they're communicating with the duct, so they'll have the high amylase levels. Branch duct IPMNs, um, depending on where they are and how much they are um, communicating with the duct. I think that they can have uh, varying amylase levels, um, but they are certainly still going to have uh, elevated CEA. And then um, main ducts have higher malignant potential, but branch ducts, duct uh, IPMN certainly still have significant malignant potential. 
And so I have some photos here and we'll look more closely at our patient um, imaging uh, after we go through these. This one is a main duct IPMN here. And you can see the big dilated um, pancreatic duct up here. And then uh, this one is a branch duct IPMN. And, and then that's you know, one place we can't see the duct, but presumably it's because it's not um, super dilated. So go back, go back to that last, the previous picture real quick. Uh, one more, back. So what else do you notice on that scan that's particularly worrisome? Just something you should um, always be looking for on these. Is this a, a mural nodule? Yeah, I'm more referring to, it looks like yeah, there's some pancreatitis. So anytime you're oh. looking at a cyst, if there's pancreatitis, that's worrisome. So always look for that when you're looking at a cyst imaging. All right, uh, Kat, let's see how much attention you were paying. Yes. All right, when do you operate on a pseudocyst? Um, pseudocyst is six and six. Good, that's a good answer for the test. When do you operate on an SCN? An SCN, ooh. Um, when you start having compressive symptoms. Yeah, only potential. symptomatic, right? So no real malignant potential, so you only operate if they're symptomatic. When do you mm -hmm. operate on MCN? Uh, typically they say three centimeters, but that's hogwash, so it's in the tail. Okay. So you can operate right. on them. Yeah, that's basically right. On the test, to be honest, if they gave you a two centimeter MCN, I would probably watch it because that's probably okay. the test answer. The real life answer, you could go either way. Uh, and then in a male, you should always operate too. So the malignant potential is probably higher in males. They're pretty rare in males. But in general, just operate on a male, operate on a woman over three centimeters uh, and then think about it under. And then uh, the IPMN is much more complicated. So we'll, we'll next transition into that. And um, just a brief interruption because Dr. Carlson photo. It's it's a thing. Um, okay, so moving on to IPMN. Um, this is the algorithm from the Fukuoka guidelines. So the important thing about this is that you are dealing with a confirmed IPMN. So um, we have cross-sectional imaging that suggests that it's an IPMN, and then you have the um, cytology that shows that it has a high CEA level. And so um, once you have so the Meg, there's another really key component. These are not just confirmed IPMNs, but what kind of IPMN? Um, like main duct IPMNs? No. So what do you do with a main duct IPMN? You take it out. It's branch yeah. duct IPMN, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So main duct, in general, you operate because they have a high malignant potential. This is only for non-main duct, so either mixed or, bran or branch duct. Uh, and again, you have to confirm that it's an IPMN. So this is not the algorithm for all cystic neoplasms of the pancreas by any means. Thank you. Um, and so the first step is um, looking for these high risk features that are um, written in this box up here. So um, for patients with a branched or mixed up IPMN and that have these high risk features um, such as obstructive jaundice, um, enhancing solid component, uh, or if the pancreatic duct, the main duct is dilated greater than or equal to a centimeter, um, that's gonna push you towards surgery. If they don't have those high risk features, then you start to look for your worry, uh, worrisome features down here. So um, Dr. Vreeland also already mentioned um, clinical pancreatitis or uh, pancreatitis, I guess, on imaging as well. And then some worrisome features are if the cyst is greater um, or equal to three centimeters, if you have a thickened or enhancing cyst wall, if the pancreatic duct is um, greater than four millimeters, but less than a centimeter, so this is that five to nine millimeter range for your um, main duct, um, or you can see a non-enhancing neural nodule or an abrupt change in the caliber of the duct with some distal pancreatic atrophy. So if you have any of these worrisome features, you then proceed to endoscopic ultrasound. If you do not have these features, um, you the, the Fukuoka guidelines talks about evaluating the size of the largest cyst within the neoplasm and helping you to 
decide how to surveil these patients based on that. And um, after we finish with this algorithm, I'll talk more about the, the GI guidelines and um, how they're a little bit different. Um, but back to if we have worrisome features and we um, proceed to endoscopic ultrasound, um, what are we looking for in endoscopic ultrasound? So this is not us um, looking to see if like the CEA has gone up or anything like that, um, because you know the CEA is just telling you if the, the um, lesion is mucinous or not. And so we've already established that it is. And the cutoff for deciding if um, a lesion is mucinous based on an elevated CEA is a CEA of 192. That's the um, number that they've chosen where it gives you the best sensitivity or specificity. So um, this time when we go in and do endoscopic ultrasound for the worrisome features, we're looking for um, a neural nodule on endoscopic ultrasound, looking for suspicious um, duct features or cytology. So if you have um, cells that are more suggestive of um, a cancer. Um, and so the some of the other stuff that they've started looking at since these guidelines were created were standing for KRAS or other genes. Um, but my understanding of that is that it hasn't been super helpful so far in deciding who to operate on um, or who I guess has more potential. Um, and so we mentioned uh, the local guidelines talking about different sizes of the cysts. Um, so these are the AGA guidelines, which um, are kind of similar, but I guess there are some key differences. And these recommendations basically state that um, patients with small cysts without worrisome or high-risk features should get um, surveillance MRIs. And so the first one you do one year after your initial diagnosis, and then you'll do it every two years after that for a total of five years, as long as they don't develop any um, changes or develop any worrisome features or obviously high-risk features. Um, patients who have high-risk features should get an EUS, um, and then if they don't have concerning features on EUS, um, then they fall back into that um, screening that we just talked about. So um, MRI in one year, and then every two years after that. Um, any changes that are noted on any of these surveillance imagings uh, warrant an endoscopic ultrasound. So the interesting thing about these guidelines is that they say that after the five years of screening, if um, you know nothing has changed and the cyst looks the same, that you can stop surveillance after five years. Um, there have been subsequent studies that have evaluated these guidelines and the Fukuoka guidelines, and um, I think that there have been a few papers that have kind of refuted that, specifically one in the Annals of Surgery that did a um, query of this prospective registry uh, for people with pancreatic cysts, and that one showed that there was this 10% um, of patients basically who we had said, okay, your cyst hasn't grown. We've been looking at it for five years. We don't have to look anymore. Uh, about 10% of those patients um, eventually did develop features that would um, put them into, like cross them over into that um, higher risk or worrisome features um, threshold. And so I think it's interesting uh, it's definitely an interesting discussion and hearing the surgical oncologists here talk about um, their surveillance techniques. I think that it's important to obviously look at the whole patient and decide, um, you know, is this patient going to tolerate a surgery if they do need one? And um, if they do need one, are they, you know, how long are they going to live after surgery and things like that? Because obviously, if you're not planning on intervening, um, then it, you know, we shouldn't keep looking and, and keep surveilling these patients. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think the other issue is how to, you know, what imaging modality, right? So I really like to look at CT scans because I think that the cuts are finer and they give me a little more detail. But, you know, if you have a 35 year old with a one centimeter cyst, are you going to get CT scans every year for the rest of their life? No. Uh, so most people use MRI to do surveillance on these, and then if they start to develop worrisome features, maybe get a CT for finer detail. Um, and then EUS can be used as well. So some people will alternate MRI and EUS every year, things like that, if it's big enough to be EUS. And then if it gets worrisome, alternate MRI and EUS more frequently. There's a lot of controversy about what to do there. 
and people hate doing abdominal MRIs because, you know, it's like an hour in the tube and people constantly complain about it. So, you know, there's, there's not clear and definite guidelines on what to do with the non worrisome uh, assist. And so most people go to like MRI every year for five. And then I would say what we were taught in fellowship is they just spaced it to two years, but nobody knows when to stop. And so most people kind of don't really stop unless you get to at least 10 years. And then even then you don't really know for sure. I mean, this guy, you know, he's a, a good example. He was followed for, I don't know how long, 12 years or something. Oh, yeah, I, now he did have changes, right? So like the lesion was subtly changing, but not for the first few years. So um, anyway, I, I, I would not stop at five years personally. I don't think the data supports that. Yeah, the ones that I struggle with are the ones that are like five millimeters and, you know, maybe like three, five millimeter cysts and they somehow end up with us. And I feel like we're just. Yeah, I think, I think that's I mean, very. But I mean, these are just all, there's all, there's all sorts of unanswered questions. I mean, um, you know, one of the things that is the biggest one is not just how long to surveil these. That's certainly one of the big ones, but then. Um, how do we get better at discriminating who really benefits from surgery right now? Um, you know, we've kind of settled on the right or what we agree. Um, but there's both false positives and false negatives to what we're doing right now. And it's not, it's, it's definitely not where we'd like it to be. Yeah. Just like we talked about in conference, the, the there is no guideline. There is no hard and fast guideline when to stop surveillance because the guidelines disagree and you know fukuoka says follow them for life and the aga says stop at five years and that's driven by the fact that gastroenterologists typically do a lot of surveillance of these in the community rather than in cancer centers where they have like these dedicated pancreas assist type places but the issue is we still way over treat we're still way over surveilling and even when we follow these people and do delayed resection after the end, the cancer rate is still uh, enormously low relative to the amount of other stuff that we're doing with everybody else. But the hard and fast thing, like we talked about in conferences, stop surveilling them when you're not gonna offer them treatment regardless of what you find. And that comes up, at least that came up, I think in my boards. So you don't have to follow them until they're dead. You can follow them until you're like, okay, we both agree we're not gonna do anything about what we find. Thank you. Um, so getting back to our patient, as Dr. Vreeland already um, alluded to, this guy is a really great example. Um, we previously saw a representative image from his 2013 scan, at which point he was completely asymptomatic. Um, his CEA and imaging were consistent with a pretty small branch duct IPMN. He didn't have any high risk or worrisome features. And therefore, he continued to get his surveillance imaging and, you know, for the first few years, didn't really see any changes. And then over the past few years, the lesion enlarged and he developed these two different mural nodules. And this is obviously difficult to see on one image. So I have this um, video I took where I scroll through the scan in a painfully slow manner for all of us to watch. Um, and so... We see that the lesion has gotten much bigger and it has these nodules. Um, I thought when I first looked at it that the duct was uh, dilated because I could see it so clearly. It, it really is only like four millimeters, I think. Um, so it, it really wasn't that large. Um, but with his, um, you know, with these changes and those specifically, I think the mural nodules, um, that's really what pushed us to offer this guy a surgery. And so um, he um, he underwent a Whipple last week and um, tolerated the procedure pretty well, or this week, tolerated the procedure really well, and he is um, currently recovering up on the floor. So we're awaiting his pathology and um, we'll see how he does. So that's the other aspect. We talked about this a little bit with the MCNs, right? But the other thing that changes your decision-making in these is what kind of surgery they need, right? So if you have a, a somewhat concerning IPMN that's way out on the tail, your threshold for operating is gonna be lower than this guy who had an unsinate tumor. And the real problem with an unsinate IPMN is that the main duct of the pancreas is pretty much normal. And the pancreas itself is pretty much normal. And this guy's BMI is like 35. 
And so all those things make him very high risk for a leak. And so you're, you know, you're going to hesitate to operate on these people. So I, he, I really tried to get him. I actually waited like six months and tried to get him to lose weight. And he did lose like 20 pounds, um, which, but he was still so fat and uh, it made the operation harder. And, you know, it's just the, the patients who are at high risk for, for a leak are patients who don't have pancreas cancer because patients that have pancreas cancer have a firmer gland and tend to have had some pancreatitis from that uh, and their duct will be more dilated. So a non-pancreas cancer diagnosis, a normal duct, which is defined as kind of three millimeters or less, uh, or being obese. So if you're any of those, according to the MD Anderson data, if you're any of those, you fit into the high risk group. So to not be high risk, you have to have pancreas cancer, not be super obese, uh, and have a dilated duct. Um, and so he kind of hit all three of those criteria. And so his risk of leak is high. You know, the data from Anderson would say that his risk of leak is like 60%. And so, you know, that makes you more hesitant to operate. That's just the reality. Uh, whether, you know, and that's, you know, if you really believe it has cancer in it, then you got to operate uh, or it's high risk to develop a cancer. Um, but it certainly changes the math in your head a little bit. So. Is that your last slide, Meg? Yes. So the other really difficult decision to make and that comes up, you guys probably, it wouldn't come up on your boards too much, but uh, certainly on our Sir John boards, this always comes up. We're one of the chiefs, is Johnny on or uh, let's go with Tassin. So, so this picture here has a main duct IPMN that's kind of right in the middle of the pancreas. When you have a main duct IPMN like that, a lot of times the whole duct is dilated. The whole pancreatic duct is dilated. So let's say on your oral boards, they show you a picture and it's a coronal slice of a CT scan and the entire duct of the pancreas is dilated. Uh, and they tell you that a, they did, you know, EUS and the CEA is high. It's a main duct IPMN. And there's a nodule, um, there's a concerning nodule in the head. So what operation are you going to do for that patient? Uh, I guess a pancreatic, like a, a Whipple, but with uh, extending to take more pancreas to include that IPMN. Okay, but the IPMN goes all the way to the tail. Oh. Uh, the whole duct is dilated. Did they biopsy that nodule? Should we biopsy that nodule? It's it's the biopsy. Does it, matter? Does it matter? I guess I, I don't I don't I don't know for certain. I mean, it's not a cancer, right? So let's say they biopsy it and they say, yeah, there's some low grade dysplasia in that nodule. But either way, the nodule is concerning. It's enhancing on MRI. You're gonna you want to take it out. So yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a difficult scenario, but you're right. I mean, you would do a Whipple, and then you'd be worried about your margin. Is basically the bottom line. There are two you know, a couple things that could be happening there, right? So one, the nodule could be so big that it's actually causing some compression of the duct and the backside of the duct is dilated because uh, because of compression, because of pressure, right? So that's that would be the best case scenario that you, you know, that duct is just dilated because of, uh, because of built up pressure from that big nodule. Uh, but more likely is that the an IPMN, most of us think of IPMNs as a field defect. So it's like uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, right? So we resect the one tumor you can see, but the rest of the liver is abnormal. They're very high risk to develop more uh, cancers elsewhere, like uh, LCIS in the breast. So, so the whole pancreas is abnormal, and that whole duct in a main duct IPMN, the whole duct is probably abnormal. And so you have to make a decision what to do. So the, our options are a total pancreatectomy to make sure you got it all out, or what you said, David, is like a Whipple and then kind of worry and extend it to the left a little bit. So that's generally what people do is if there's kind of a tapering and you say, well, I think I can get the whole IPMN, then you do that. You do like an extended Whipple. But at some point you got to stop and doing a total is extremely morbid. So the perioperative mortality for a total pancreatectomy is probably 10% or more. And so, you know, you really want to avoid doing a total pancreatectomy. So what you can do is do your Whipple and then send a frozen of the duct. And then let's say it comes back with low grade dysplasia. What are you going to do? 
I'm not 100% certain, but I, I think I would probably stop there in fear of if you just take more and more and more pancreas, eventually you end up with basically a total, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, exactly. yeah so that that's the right answer. So most patients with a main duct IPMN will probably have a little bit of low-grade dysplasia throughout their duct. And so, you know, you go in with the mindset of, I'm going to leave low-grade dysplasia behind. And you hope that you get nothing at the margin, but chances are you'll get low-grade dysplasia. So Mr. Cantu, the guy we took, they said they saw focal low-grade dysplasia at his margin, and I said, who cares? Personally, part of that is because I think our pathologists just call stuff all the time on Frozen. Uh, and, you know, his duct was pretty normal over there. I, I think he probably did not have real low-grade dysplasia, but we'll see. Even if he does, that's fine. So what am I going to do for that low-grade dysplasia? Am I going to go back and operate if the final path comes back with dysplasia at the margin? Uh, no, you'll surveil him, uh, and you're going to be surveilling him anyway. Exactly, yeah. So these patients aren't off the hook. Even though he went through his Whipple, he still has to be surveilled for life. Um, and then you look. The problem is after a Whipple, I expect his the back half of his duct to dilate a little bit. And so then it's like, you know, you have to get MRIs and look for nodules, and, you know, he'll probably end up getting more EUSs and, uh, you know, if they if he starts to develop a nodule in the back half of his pancreas, then I would think about doing a total. But even then, you know, he's 71. Let's say he's 80 now and he has a nodule in the back half of his pancreas. And, you know, I'm going to have to offer him a total pancreatectomy. I would not do a total pancreatectomy in an 80 year old. I don't think I mean, I would have a conversation with him about it. But, you know, it, the, so what is a what is life like for a total pancreatectomy? What are the problems they run into, David? Uh, the first one I think of is diabetes and it's very difficult to control. Um, yeah. they have, of course, uh, no more exocrine function of their pancreas. So they, they have to take additional, uh, enzymes for, you know, digestion, absorption and nutrients. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's probably the main things, right? So, but the, the key is that their diabetes is brittle in both directions, right? So they have high blood sugar. It's hard to control, but they also... The really scary thing for these patients is they have no glucagon and so they can get hypoglycemic and so that that's where a lot of them get into trouble is they you know they get hypoglycemic and you can die from hypoglycemia the one patient i had a perioperative death and fellowship was a total who died in the middle of the night and he just didn't wake up the next day and we don't really know why uh and the thought is that he probably got hypoglycemic while he was sleeping and just didn't wake up and so the, you know, again, that it's not just even perioperative mortality, it's mortality for the rest, you know, over 10 years, five years, these patients just, their quality of life is poor and their risk of mortality is very high. Uh, and so doing a total pancreatectomy should not be taken lightly. And so that's why most, the consensus is to accept low grade dysplasia at your margin for a main duct IPMN. And then, you know, again, even some people would, would just go in with the mindset of like, I'm going to march back until there's a centimeter or two of pancreas left, and then I'm not going to send a frozen on that last bit. I'm just going to accept that there's probably some dysplasia there, um, even if it's high grade, because the, the risk is so high. That's an area of real controversy, is what to do if you have high grade dysplasia on your last frozen. And if you leave a couple centimeters of pancreas, they're not going to have meaningful exocrine function, but the difference is they'll have a little bit of glucagon. So their risk of hypoglycemia is not there. And that's probably what, what is the most dangerous aspect of a total pancreatectomy. Sean, Rob, Travis, any other thoughts? I think I think you covered the cyst pretty well, Meg. I don't have a whole lot more to add. Can I have it? Yeah, I, sorry, I had to step out for the Department of Surgery meeting, so I didn't catch the last bit, but um, I'm sure you guys covered it all. I think it's it's important to stress the importance of surveillance in these. So uh, another high level is, is CINDIS, or is there a, four, a clinical four or a clinical five besides TAS in there? What, what you get to, if someone comes with like a two centimeter, somewhat worrisome, but branch duct IPM, then they're like, well, well, doc, what's my chances of having cancer over the course of my life? What would you tell them? Good, crickets. So as long as they get surveilled, you're not going to drop anything. Uh, the, and 
then the, the cancer risk as best we can tell is very low. So you got to take all these numbers of like how much their malignancy rate with a little bit of grain of salt because these are all patients that made it to surgery, which got and they got selected for surgery because they had concerning features on on imaging. And so, it, you know, if, if you have time with all of these cysts is I hope what you've figured out and particularly from what Dr. Breland was saying, what he did with Mr. Cantu. We look at the, the memorial experience where they have his dedicated cyst clinic. That's all they see day in and day out. And these people are on very uh, regimented surveillance scans. Even the people with quote unquote worrisome features, if you follow them late and then they still get to surgery, only less than 5% of them will have a cancer. So part of it, a lot of the talk that we have with the patients is kind of talking them off the cliff because they hear from their primary doc, oh, I've got this cyst. I've got to have my pancreas out because I, I must have cancer. No, probably not. So, you know, but the part, but you have to surveil them and the people that get in trouble are like our veterans and everybody like that, they get this big, they get this worrisome cyst and then kind of fall off. And then they come back three years later and the cyst looks really ugly. We could have intervened earlier or we could have done, we could have changed management in the earlier part. But uh, cysts without definitive high-risk features, very low rate of cancer. I'll just add a couple of comments to um, for those total pancreatectomies that we sometimes, we rarely did total pancreatectomies and st still have yet to do any since I've been here in San Antonio, but one of the options that you do have longer on down the road, so you allow them a chance for recovery, is um, uh, you can do a pancreatic islet cell transplant that will help. That actually is very successful in taking hold um, but it's it's not a durable uh, transplant in that um, they will typically work for a few years and then they burn themselves out. The other thing is that, that we will sometimes, we, we talk about surveillance like it's uh, very easy to do. Surveillance is actually very difficult to do, and what I'm referring to is actually getting your patients their imaging done their labs done. Uh, you have to have a good uh, team that actually does this. So whose responsibility is it to get that surveillance done? We tell the patients, yeah, in two years, you're going to come back after you've had your imaging. How do, you, how do those processes, what are those mechanisms in place within your office that's going to get those done? Uh, it's it's difficult to do, to, to keep track of, and also to keep track of your patients medical legally, it becomes a problem because in the court of law, that responsibility is heavily weighed upon the physician rather than on the patient. So you have to have a very good team that um, can track those kind of things and making sure that those patients actually do get their imaging because if they miss it and they come back in year five and now they have a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, all eyes are going to be up on you. Yeah, I, do. I, I think if you have high grade dysplasia throughout, you can. Uh, right now, I have cell transplants not an option just because of the concern that you transplant these plastic cells. Um, I do keep. I did. I did a. We did a, a total pancreatectomy at BAMC, I don't know, three years ago on the Saudi Air Force dude. Um, that wasn't for IPMNs though. Um, I, I keep hoping that the automated pancreas, the basically um, external insulin pumps that uh, continuously monitor blood sugar um, will, I, I do think that will at some point come of age to where um, one managing type one diabetes, but two uh, doing a total pancreatectomy won't be as morbid, um, maybe someday. Yeah, I should probably add, it's a very select population that we offered uh, islet cell transplants to. And um, it may have fallen out of favor, I should admit, it may have fallen out of favor more now, but um, again, it's not something that we had to entertain. I do remember that total pancreatectomy. I even remember a, a, pan a patient that we sent to MD Anderson, Travis, I think it was your patient, in fact, that, um, no, it was my patient, had identified a single lesion, but by the time they got the MD Anderson, they had additional imaging. They found a second lesion in the tail of the pancreas and they ended up getting a total pancreatectomy. 
Um, Tim, I don't know if you were there at that time. I kind of, I want to say you were, but um, anyways, it does happen. Uh, it should not be taken lightly. And we haven't really talked about any of post-operative complications and how you manage that. Of course, there are time constraints here, but uh, that all leads to uh, a very considerable amount of time to educate your patients and discuss uh, the complication risk with them. Yeah, that's a great point, Sean. I, I will say that for Mr. Cantu, I just told him that he's going to have a complication. Just it's just a question of which one. So that these these IPMN whipples are always difficult and. Again, their leak risk is so high, and uh, so that you do have to. I mean, again, I waited months to operate on him to try to get him to lose weight, and you know, make sure that he was ready for it. And he he really wasn't. He didn't really want to have surgery, and then he kind of finally came around. Um, but yeah, certainly a lot of time counseling these patients. Rob and I were just texting about cyst clinic and fellowship and how painful it was because you know the patients all come in thinking they have pancreas cancer, so you have to kind of talk them off the ledge in that regard. And then the few that you do have to operate, you have to kind of counsel them that they're going to have complications. And it's a there's a lot of there's a lot of hand holding in the pancreatic cyst clinic for sure. The other one that the, you have to do is the uh, I think the small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, low grade ones. Those are the most are the worst because then I mean it's like well those are ones that don't need surgery but they already know that they're cancer. And, you know, you can see that that's what Steve Jobs died from. Um, anyway, those ones I think are even harder just because it says cancer in it. When you okay. Google it, it comes up as cancer. And while we're on that note, Meg, did you touch on like the kind of cancers people with malignant IPMNs have? I did not. That's okay. Just so you know, there's some, um, the IPMN cancers, uh, many of them behave in a more benign fashion than just straight up garden variety pancreatic ductal cancer. So it's another part of it too. Is this thing like they have this tube, they have this thing called a tubular cancer and a colloid cancer and all that stuff. Oh. But um, the pancreas cancers that we see with malignant IPMN aren't necessarily as you know evil as PDI. It's never good, but that's another part of the equation too, which is why I earlier we're talking about kind of time is your friend with these. You have you, we, you have time to figure these patients out a little bit. And you don't have to rush necessarily to the OR, particularly in the, in the unclear cases. That's all. Thank you. Good job.